well, um, let me restart introduce you first. And uh, uh, perhaps everyone can hear. Uh, okay, so um, I would like to wish welcome uh, everyone to this um, uh, Helsinki Dis Distinguished uh, uh, Lecture Series on Future Information Technology organized by Helsinki Institute for Information Technology, which is a joint institute uh, of Aalto University and uh, University of Helsinki. My name is Kimo Kaski, and I'm hosting today's uh, webinar uh, presented by uh, Professor Risto Mikulainen. We are very happy to have Risto with us joining from California early in the morning, I guess. And uh, so let me say a few words about Risto as an introduction. Well, I, I, I see uh, 53 pages of CV, but I, I won't spend all time to do, do that. I just pick up a few things from there. Well, Risto Mikulainen is a, is a professor of computer science at uh, the University of Texas, Austin, and associate vice president of evolutionary AI at Cognizant. He received his uh, master's degree at Helsinki University of Technology, now out of University, um, 1986 in uh, applied mathematics and PhD in computer science from UCLA, University of California, Los Angeles in 1990. His current research uh, focus on, uh, focuses on methods um, and applications of neural evolution, as well as neural network models of uh, natural language processing and vision. He is an author of over 430 articles in these research areas at Cognizant and previously at, uh, uh, as um, Chief uh, Technology Officer of, uh, of uh, uh, Sentinent Technologies. He is um, um, scaling up these approaches to real world problems. As for academic honors, Risto is an IEEE fellow his work on neuroevolution has recently been recognized with uh, uh, IEEE CIS Evolutionary Computing Pioneer, Pioneer Award and uh, the Kabor Award uh, of International Neural Network Society and Outstanding Paper of the Decade uh, Award uh, of the International Society for Artificial Life. But the title of Risto's presentation is Evolutionary Surrogate Assisted uh, Prescription, which is indeed very timely, as he is also discussing non pharmaceutical interventions of COVID 19. We will conduct uh, these lectures in such a way that Risto uh, will give his um, about 60 minute uh, presentation without interruptions. And after that, we have these uh, questions and uh, answer sessions uh, uh, conducted orally by raising hand, and then you are giving, giving the floor to present uh, your questions. This lecture is recorded and put uh, uh, to the HEAT webpage, Helsinki Institute of Information, for Information Technology webpage. Okay, Risto, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Kimmo. Yes, uh, that was a very nice introduction, and and indeed, um, it's it's great to be back, even if virtually, uh, to Helsinki. Um, now that's where I started my career, um, and and still have very very fond memories. And actually, what I'm talking about is related to what we did back then. Um, so, but the world has changed quite a bit, uh, and one of the interesting things already on this slide is that academia and industry are now very close together. So like this team um, here, my, my colleagues at uh, Cognizant, actually two of them, Santiago and Elliot, are my PhD students. Santiago will be defending next week. Elliot defended a couple of years ago. Um, and they did their research at, uh, in industry, uh, but they got academic um, 
degree for that research. So academic and industry research are very closely linked now. And I think that's great because we are much closer to applications. We get ideas, we get problems from industry, we get resources, but we also have access to academic resources. So, so this, is, uh, this is something that uh, I think is new and it's interesting and exciting. Uh, and this uh, talk is a result of it. Um, okay, uh, so uh, let's see. This is the starting point. Uh, the main question, how do we make good decisions? Uh, and interesting enough, this is the question that we were asking in the 80s when I was in, uh, in Helsinki University of Technology uh, as a master's student there uh, in um, Rai Mohamalainen and Sampar Wood's lab, um, making good decisions, supporting decision makers. Uh, but then, like I said, world is quite different now. Now we have a lot of data. Everybody who's making decisions in businesses or government education, uh, they have data about uh, patients, about customers, about students, their behavior, about the outcomes. Uh, and that's enough to build predictive models. Uh, we can look at a current situation and uh, build a model that will tell us what will happen in the future. But those models do not tell us how to make decisions about how we should change something so that we get more desirable outcomes. That problem of how to make good decisions is a different learning problem from the predictive problem. Um, and it is a difficult one um, for numerous reasons. Uh, first of all, we don't usually know what the optimal decisions are. Um, the domain that we are making them in is partially observable. We don't know all the variables that go into this student's decision to do something or the customer's decision to pick something from the shelf or something else. Um, and also those factors interact in a nonlinear way. Uh, weather, for instance, can have a very drastic effect on, on, on what you buy um, and it can be nonlinear. Um, so those techniques that we were using back in the 80s, like linear programming and, and mathematical optimization in general, mathematical programming, um, they are not easy to apply in that kind of situation. Um, a lot of times they are still used in industry, of course, uh, but we end up with many different uh, LP models, for instance, to capture the non-linearities of the world. Um, and also the gradient descent methods that now are so powerful in many tasks like vision and language. We can't really use them because we don't have a target from which we could propagate the gradients. Um, so that's a different kind of a learning problem uh, where the techniques that have been developed over the years uh, don't quite reach. Um, so what we need to do instead is to search for those decision strategies. Uh, try something and see how well it works, modify it so it would work better, and hopefully over time uh, end up with good decision strategies. Um, and, and that's fine, except that it's very costly, obviously. Some of the candidates cannot be tested in the real world at all in some domains. You can't design rockets and build rockets and have them explode 100,000 times before you find one that flies stable um, in a stable manner or recommending treatments for patients. You cannot experiment with patients um, very easily anyway. So um, that's usually not possible. Also simulators, which could in principle help you uh, decide what is working and what isn't. They are also sometimes very hard to build. Uh, they are inaccurate, like in robotics. Everybody knows in robotics that Simulated robotic controls do not really transfer that well to real world physical robots. Um, and they are costly to build or they are just impossible to build because we don't understand the domain well enough. For instance, some, in some of these social decision-making situations. Um, so that's where the surrogate optimization approach comes in. Uh, the idea there is that instead of the real world or simulator, we use um, historical data to build a predictive model. Like I said, everybody has data, let's use it. Let's take, take advantage of it. If you have data on past decisions, um, actions in past situations, and then we have also um, an associated outcome of how well that decision in that situation worked out, then we can build a predictive model that can be used as a surrogate. So it's not a simulation from first principles. It's important to understand the distinction. We don't necessarily have to understand how the world works. We just have to observe it uh, long enough and often enough that we cover most of the situations and possible decisions and see the outcomes. And then we can uh, build a surrogate that helps us search for those good decision strategies. Now, it is still difficult <laughs> to find good decision strategies. Uh, the search space is nonlinear. Uh, it can be deceptive, more, look more like this than, than this. 
And it's much harder landscape to find these peaks in the highest peaks than, than here, where a couple of restarts will probably find you that peak. Um, this is also a really simple space because it's very low dimensional. There's really just two dimensions to search in. Uh, but the large, uh, the, the real world spaces are much larger. They might have hundreds of thousands or millions of parameters that you have to search. And they are multi-objective. Almost always when you're making decisions, there's some kind of performance you want to maximize and some kind of cost that you want to minimize. Um, so you end up with having a, a parade of front, a, a selection of trade-offs that you uh, then give to the decision maker. So the search is difficult uh, for current methods like Cregan or Bayesian parameter optimization, as well as reinforcement learning like DQN and, and a PPO and so on. Uh, we'll look at those uh, in a few minutes. Uh, but there is one technique that kind of stands out when you really have the scale up challenge and, and that is uh, evolutionary computation. Um, it is actually really well posed in uh, attacking problems like this that have really huge search spaces, very high dimensional search spaces and very deceptive search spaces. Um, and this of course, evolutionary computation has been around for a while. Um, it's applied to black box optimization a lot of times, finding an optimum of a function, a hidden function. Um, but here we are looking for more than that. We're actually looking for an entire strategy, a decision-making strategy. It's a mapping, it's a function itself that we are trying to search for, not a single point. Um, so one idea is that why don't we search for a neural network uh, that represents a strategy? So we are using evolution optimization, the search, uh, to design a neural network, everything in it, uh, the connectivity, the connection weights, all the parameters are designed by evolution without any gradients at all uh, by using the search. And that gives us the decision-making strategy. So that's the general idea. Um, and that's what ESP is about, evolutionary surrogate assisted prescription, uh, the method that we developed at uh, Cognizant with that theme uh, that I showed you. Um, the idea is to combine a neural network surrogate, this predictive model that's trained with historical data using gradient descent. We have the data, we can use it um, with a neural network strategy that's now then evolved because there are no, no targets. Uh, we find those neural networks using evolution. Uh, so, it, so ESP consists of these two neural networks trained with different learning methods for different tasks. Uh, now, this doesn't come from a vacuum. Um, we built a couple of applications in the real world uh, in the last few years, uh, and then putting them together gives us ESP. So this one here in the middle uh, is a picture of a lab at uh, MIT Media Lab, um, open, AI, open Agriculture Lab. Um, we developed together with them an approach to optimizing growth recipes for agriculture uh, automatically. Uh, and there, we did have to build a surrogate model uh, because it takes a long time to grow plants. Uh, we chose basil because it grows in three weeks. So we could, in three weeks, we could see how well our growth recipe um, worked. And the recipe consists of decisions like how much water, what kind of nutrients, what temperature, what kind of light, how long the day is, things like that. Um, and we tried to search for optimal recipes in order to get the basil to grow as well as possible, as big as possible, as tasty as possible. Um, and the surrogate model was essential in it, that we could um, only plant a couple of hundreds plants and measure how well they really worked, uh, the growth recipes worked. But with the surrogate, we could test millions of, of different um, trial recipes, candidate recipes to find the good ones. And indeed some surprising things came out. Basil doesn't need to sleep. That was one of the most important ones. You keep the lights on 24 hours, it thrives. And this was a big surprise for the biologists, botanists. They did not know, they did not anticipate that and, and evolution still found it. Um, and that is the, the promise of this approach that you can find solutions that would escape human decision makers um, using this automated approach. So that's one part. It was a problem solving heavily dependent on the surrogate uh, another example on the right is uh, optimization of web interfaces. Uh, this was a system called Ascend. Uh, now it's in a separate startup called Evolve um, without an E in the end. Um, this, the challenge here was to design a web interface so that the user who comes to the site 
would be most likely to press on that button that signs them up or you know ask for a newsletter or pays for something that's in general called conversion optimization so a user is converted to a paying customer um, and and the challenge was to design the web page so that it would be most like the user would be most likely to press the button and it turns out it actually matters what you put on that page the colors the textual prompts uh, the organization um, all of those the contrast all of those matter uh, and even though they are experts in the field, uh, they call themselves conversion scientists, uh, they understand perceptual psychology and have a lot of experience, there were still uh, discoveries to be made um, that they missed. For instance, that they would call this part that we evolved, um, and over, over time when they saw these examples, they called it the ugly widget generator because it looked ugly to them. These, des these designs looked ugly to the human designers but they performed 45% better uh, than any of the human designs. So there are still principles that we don't understand how people make these decisions and evolution can discover them. Um, so here, uh, we, at one point, we decided that we actually wanted to make this customized so that different users who come to the site get different web pages. And that was actually a huge help. Uh, it turns out people have different preferences and uh, you need to segment your uh, user base to those different uh, preferences, and then you can be much more effective. So there we evolved this neural network to make a mapping uh, from user description, uh, who they are, that is where they are in the world, what time it is, what day of the week, um, whatever we know about them, what browser they're using, what operating system and so on. Uh, even that kind of information was helpful in deciding what kind of web page they should see. Um, here we did not have a surrogate. All these web pages, all these candidates were actually given to real users to look at. And we could evaluate maybe through 2000 users how well the web pages um, performed. Um, and, and it was possible to evolve it. Uh, but that was only using the bottom model, evolved neural network to make these decisions for particular users. So in ESP, we put both of those together. Um, we have a predictor as a surrogate and a prescriptor uh, as the decision-making system. Um, so let's look at how that works. Um, the, the main co the focus is, of course, in the prescriptor, uh, and it looks at context, which is uh, variables that describe where the decision is made. So you could think of it as handing you a problem. The problem is described by the variables that, in the context. And then the prescriptor gives you the action. It's the direct neural network mapping, nonlinear mapping, from the context to the actions that this particular neural network that implements a strategy thinks is optimal for that situation. Um, but notice that, again, the actions are not known. So we have to start with a large population of, of neural networks, uh, and some of them make better decisions than others. And then evolution will pick those, uh, reproduce, and, and we get better decision-making neural networks over time. But the crucial question is, how do we evaluate which ones of those neural networks in the population are, are good, are promising. And that's where we need the surrogate. Uh, we cannot go to the real world in general. In some cases we can, but like in the Ascend case, uh, the web page optimization, but usually we cannot in most cases. Um, so therefore we need the surrogate to ask uh, because we want to evolve, like I said, millions of these decision-making candidates in order to find the ones that perform really well. Um, so the predictor, uh, is again, a neural network. It could be something else. Um, we've used random forest, for instance, uh, if there's little data. If there's a lot of data, neural net performs generally better. Um, and the neural net sees, again, the same context, the same problem. And now it also sees what the candidate suggests uh, and it maps that to a predicted outcome. Uh, and that's what the neural network's inputs are. And this is what the neural net's output is. Uh, and this outcome could be multiple dimensions. It could be predicted cost, predicted um, uh, efficacy of the treatment, the side effects of the treatment, many dimensions possibly. But this is based on historical data that has already been collected. Um, so the predictor is relatively straightforward. It's standard machine learning uh, based on historical data. But it then allows us to evaluate these candidate prescriptors because whatever the candidate strategy is doing, we can ask the predictors, how well, how good do you think this uh, prescriptor is? 
Uh, so putting these together into a process, how you would apply it to a problem in the real world, um, here's a little loop, uh, how you would do it. The predictors here and the prescriptors here, and here's the real world. So in a easiest, perhaps the most optimal, or um, let's say if the world was perfect, this is how it would work. Uh, you would have your data set already collected by, uh, in, um, in advance. So you'd have your context action outcome triples, lines in some CSV file, um, and that's already something that exists before you begin. Then you use that uh, with backprop, um, deep learning, uh, to train this predictor um, to map context and actions to outcomes. And once you have the predictor working well, then you evolve the prescriptor. And now you generate a population, you ask the predictor how good is every member in the population, and then you pick the best ones, throw away the bad ones, the best ones multiply, you get offspring, uh, and then you evaluate the offspring again. And this way you are conducting a population-based search uh, for good prescriptors. Uh, and once you're done, uh, you take some of your best pres uh, prescriptors and then you can deploy them in the real world. You can apply them in the real world, let them make the decisions. Uh, you can collect uh, data, again, how well they really did work in the real world. Uh, and you can use that new data then uh, to extend your database of, uh, of historical data. Uh, and then you can do this again. And it's important, this is an important part of AI that's currently more or less overlooked. Once you build your AI model, like in this case, it would be the decision maker, you're not done. I mean, even if you deploy it, it works for a while, but then the world changes. The seasons change, uh, the fashion changes, uh, you know, the COVID-19 virus mutates. Uh, there are all kinds of situations, or, or there's in a country, there's now a change in leadership. Uh, and then we have different kinds of policies and they're differently effective. So the world is always changing. Some of them, some of the changes are very fast, others are slow, but you collect the new data in order to keep up with the changing world. And you augment your database and you keep training your predictors and prescriptors in this loop. Um, so that's a general application. It might apply to decision-making like, uh, like COVID-19, for instance, prescriptions. Um, now, but we can take it to an extreme uh, and actually take this decision maker into a situation where the decision making is very frequent and you can't start with a knowledge base already. For instance, video games. Uh, and I'll show you an example of that. Uh, we want to get the decision maker to play a game, to be an agent in a game, like a flappy bird, deciding how to fly through uh, an obstacle course. And you can start without any knowledge of the domain. You start with your population of prescriptors. The starting point is here instead of here. Um, and now when you start with randomly uh, assigned or randomly um, configured prescriptors, uh, then you evaluate each one of them in the real game. And you are then collecting data as you go. Uh, and whenever you are evaluating a prescriptor, it doesn't do a very good job initially, but we still get training data that we can use to predict how well those actions that even the bad prescriptors do, how well they would work out. Um, and once we have the predictor, even one that just models bad prescriptors, we can use that predictor uh, to evaluate prescriptors and run evolution for a while, get better prescriptors, and that means they fly better, or they, they play the game better. We get data that now focuses on actions that are actually more useful. We get a predictor that doubt now is refined and focused more on useful actions. And, see, and, um, and predicts what uh, the outcomes are for those. And this way in this loop, we gradually together train a predictor with more useful actions and um, evaluate prescriptors with more accurate predictors. And we converge to a uh, good game playing behavior and a predictor that uh, understands how the game works. So this is in the same loop, uh, but the loop is run a little differently without uh, initial database and, and, and in a real world interaction with the, with the, uh, with the game. Uh, and already an interesting synergy emerges here. I'll demonstrate in, uh, in a few minutes that when you are doing this learning of predictor and prescriptor at the same time, as opposed to learning a predictor first and then a prescriptor, 
there's an, a synergy that the predictor actually regularizes uh, the prescriptor. Its decisions become more general and more robust. Uh, and you also have an automated curricular learning. You train the prescriptors with easy challenges first and they gradually become more uh, challenging and more refined. So it creates an, a very nice learning environment um, that results in more robust uh, prescriptors. Uh, and faster than if you were training a predictor first and then a prescription. We'll look at that in a minute. Okay, um, so there are a couple of more components uh, that I would like to talk about because they are essential in taking these um, ESP applications to the real world. And this is something you only know when you try to do it. If you're working uh, in industry, with industry, uh, get problems from industry, um, you find that there are issues that you never thought of in the lab. Um, like I said, uh, in, um, one thing that's often missing um, in current applications of AI is that you build the AI system, you throw it over the fence and you think that you're done, but the world changes and you have to keep updating. Um, this is another one like that, that you never think in a lab, um, your system performs well and you can show it in statistical significance, but that's not enough for human decision makers. They need to know whether they can trust those decisions. Uh, and the system should tell them how confident the system is about this action in this context, how confident it is that the outcome will be within this range, the, the, the performance and the, and the costs. Um, and then the human decision maker can trust it and can make an informed decision, understanding the risks. Um, and it turns out it's possible to actually do that. We did quite a bit of work uh, prompted by this real world challenge we never thought of in the lab. Um, and it turned out really interesting that if you have a neural network uh, that's looking at, <clears throat> at the data, for instance, this might be current context and action, and this output might be a prediction of outcome. Um, you can look at what errors it makes, the residual error, and you can build an other model, a Gaussian process model, for instance, that models those errors, those residuals. And that Gaussian process model gives you confidence intervals. It gives you um, measures of uncertainty in uh, the outputs of the neural net. Uh, and then you can even use that model to calibrate the output of the neural net and you can improve its accuracy. And there was a big surprise that even though you trained the heck out of the network and it's as good as it can be, there's still something more you can do by adding another model on top of it by, that just understands its mistakes. And you can correct some of those mistakes and you can understand where the uncertainty is. Uh, so this is something we apply to the predictor and we can get estimates of uncertainty, which makes it easier for the human to make decisions. Another way of allowing the human to be more confident about using the system is to let the human explore it by hand. So it means that we build a scratch pad. Once the prescriptor makes uh, decisions, make suggestions, prescribes actions. That's a starting point for the scratch pad. The user can go and modify those decisions, invest a little bit more money here, uh, maybe make that uh, COVID-19 restriction a little bit more stringent there, uh, and see by querying the predictor how those changed um, actions actually would affect the outcome. And in this way, the user can explore, the human decision maker can explore alternatives. Uh, and maybe they can use some external expertise that the model doesn't have and improve upon those uh, suggestions. Or maybe they can just explore the alternatives and find out that there's nothing they can do better. And therefore they will trust that this is really the best possible out, uh, uh, action. But either way, this is a way for a human to be confident about the actions that then are deployed in the real world. And what makes this possible is that you can like, like the predictor is used to evolve the prescriptors, it can also be used to evolve, uh, the, evaluate the modifications that the humans make. And therefore we are getting more bang for the buck that we, for the fact that we have the predictor. Okay, so now let's look at some uh, experiments and um, visualize uh, how this actually works. And it's quite interesting actually. Um, let's start with something very simple, straightforward, very concrete and visual. Um, this is our problem <laughs> here. We are doing function approximation. So this is our state or our context. 
um, it's a single number between minus 10 and 10. So this is the context. Uh, and the action is again, similar uh, number, one number between minus 10 and 10 on the vertical axis. Um, and the optimal actions are described here. This is actually a, uh, a, an, a continuous scale that get, gives you the value of that action in that state. So you can pick any point here. That means we are in minus seven and our action is minus five. The value is something like this. It's something like minus 5.4. Uh, and this is the optimal action for each possible state. So it's a sine wave. Now on the right, um, I'm showing a visualization of the different components of ESP on this problem. And this is a snapshot at one point in learning. Um, and here, the true optimal action, this sine wave is illustrated as the dashed blue line. Uh, the background uh, is not the ground truth anymore, like it was here. It's actually what the current predictor uh, thinks uh, this world is like. So the predictor gives you high um, value for uh, actions here and here and in different states. Okay, so for each different state, you look at what the optimal actions are and they are the white spot or, or, or light yellow spots. So that color coding here tells you what the predictor currently thinks the world is like. And then what we learn um, is uh, the prescriptor. Um, this is the current prescriptor. This is what actions it uh, pr um, prescribes for these different states. Uh, and it's not quite sine wave, but it, it's more or less the average of it. Um, and the most interesting complex one is the dotted white line. This is what currently would be the best prescriptor for the current predictor. Not for the ground truth, but if the predictor was the ground truth, this would be the optimal way to give you actions. Uh, and as you can see, our current predictor is not perfect. Uh, so the optimal prescriptions make these really funny suggestions, for instance, here. They're way out of, out of line compared to what we actually know is the ground truth. All right, so that's what we are showing. And now we can look at how um, ESP actually learns uh, to, to predict and prescribe. So here's an animation and it goes by pretty quick. So I played it a couple of times. Uh, it starts with the predictor in the background being very funky and it gradually learns uh, to be an approximation of sine wave. Now we're starting to see the sine wave already. Uh, in the in a colored background. Um, now, if we play it again, um, and we don't have to watch the back uh, the predictor so much, but we can look at what's optimal for the predictor. That's the white dotted line. Look how wild it is. It's all over the place. Of course, because the predictor is inaccurate. Uh, and now, when we play it again, look at what happens to the actual prescriptor that we are uh, we are learning, the orange line, and compare that with the white line. And you see that the orange line is much better. It's much closer to the sine wave uh, than the uh, dotted white line. So even though our predictor is not accurate, the prescriptor is more accurate than it should be. And this is what I meant when I said that in this interaction of the predictor learning at the same time as the prescriptor, both systems regularize. The predictor regularizes the prescriptor. And what's happening is that each prescriptor, um, each decision maker, each orange line is actually evaluated with not just a single predictor, but a number of them. Because the prescriptor candidate, if it's a good one, it stays in a population for multiple generations. And it gets to see different predictors over those multiple generations. And it tries to, and it's selected to be optimal to all of us. So it's like we had an as if we had an ensemble of predictors. Uh, and then we are learning to be good with, within that ensemble. And therefore, you learn something that's more regular, something that works with many different inaccurate predictors. And that's how you get automatic regularization. And this was a surprise. We were very, very pleased to see it, but it wasn't something we anticipated. But now we can explain it, and it actually makes a lot of sense. And, and that's very nice. Uh, Having inaccurate predictions is not a problem 
if you have a lot of them that are inaccurate in a different way, and then you can average them in a sense and as an ensemble and you get uh, better prescriptors much earlier than you should. Okay, so um, here's a comparison now with a couple of different techniques. Um, this one here is direct evolution without the surrogate. If you were just evolving the decision maker and evaluated all of those in the game itself, or in this case, it's just a function approximation, but you evaluate them with the function approximation directly without the predictor. And this shows you what an effect that ensembling of predictors have. Even after thousand episodes, the direct evolution has not found anything close to the uh, optimal one. Even though this is again, frames from that movie, from the animation, even after hundred episodes, you already got, have a prescriptor that's very good. Uh, and, 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 and that shows you the effect of having that prescriptor being learned at the same time. Um, this is another example or comparison this is PPO, uh, reinforcement learning approach. Again, in the domain itself without a surrogate. Uh, and it's doing a little better than direct evolution. After 1,000 episodes, it's starting to see a little bit of that sine wave shape, but it's nowhere near where uh, the ESP is at this point. Uh, and we can actually compare uh, over time, and we can see learning curves. This is ESP, um, the uh, MX, uh, the reward that it's receiving in this its game, the performance. Um, and here is the direct evolution. It's much noisier, much worse. And here's PPO, also not nearly as good and, and much more variance. This is regret, kind of the cost of uh, having to explore, try out things that are not good. Um, what's the total cost of those mistakes? Um, that's what regret roughly is. And you see that ESP is very quick to converge compared to PPO and uh, direct evolution. Uh, so in this sense, you can already see that ESP is faster, it's more accurate uh, and more reliable, uh, and it has lower cost. And in that case, in that sense, it would be safer too. Um, and we can compare it other, in other domains. This is um, from OpenAI Gym Benchmark, the Cardpole V0. Uh, and the plots are a little messier, but they are still tell the same story. So ESP here starts with a lot more variance, but it very quickly converges. And here we have, um, again, direct evolution uh, in orange, and then PPO uh, as green, and, and uh, DQN is added here as, as, as red one. Um, so same story, more accurate, faster convergence, less variance. And re regret, the same story. Uh, it's more reliable. And we've done it now in a number of domains. Um, now, of course, I, here I should say that ESP wasn't designed originally as a reinforcement learning approach. Um, it was designed for decision-making uh, in whatever, healthcare decisions, uh, business decisions, marketing, uh, design. Um, uh, but in order to compare with other approaches, we took it to reinforcement learning domain because there we can compare. We can run these comparisons like these ones. Um, and it turned out to our satisfaction, it turned out to perform very well uh, compared to standard reinforcement learning methods. Um, now let's uh, take it to a more interesting task. Uh, first game playing, Flappy Bird, and then um, the COVID-19 uh, decision-making. Um, but first, here's something we did think that would happen and did happen uh, with the surrogate as well. In addition to regularizing through the ensembling over time, there's an effect of automatic curricular learning because the predictor learns simple principles first and then more complex um, predictions. Um, so this is like the idea that your real world may be quite complicated, um, but if the predictor is early, it doesn't see all of that. It, can, it has only learned some of the main um, factors. And therefore, it's giving the prescriptor an easier decision-making task uh, than the later predictors. So this is just a conceptual plot. But it turns out fascinating how it actually makes sense in a domain as complex as playing a video game, like Flappy Bird. Uh, I'm sure many of you have played it and are familiar with it. It's very hard. I, I still can't fly through a, a track of Flappy Bird. Uh, and I'll just uh, show you what the game looks like when you really know how to play it. Um, you are controlling this bird by flapping its wings. And when you flap, the bird flies up. 
uh, and then gravity brings it down. Uh, it's flying at a constant speed from left to right, or in this case, we just keep the position constant and the pipes uh, come from the right side. And of course, your goal is to fly through those openings, the holes, um, um, and without hitting any of the pipes. This is very difficult, um, but it's an interesting game, still fun to play, uh, but it's also a very nice challenge for, for learning. So, um, and this is how well the approach works. This is again ESP learning, and this is direct evolution. We were really surprised to see that we couldn't really evolve uh, a neural network to fly well uh, directly. But if we had a surrogate, which predicted how good those flaps were, it actually helped a lot. And the neural networks that control the bird learned very fast and they became much better. Why? That's the, that's the, the curricular learning part. So the surrogate learns about the world, about the pipes and crashing into them. And it, at first it learns to give the bird simple challenges, just find the hole and, and go there. Um, and that's what, this is now, okay, I need to say what this is. We are now visualizing what the predictor thinks is happening. And it's an imperfect world view of the world. It hasn't learned all the complexities and predict where the pipes will be, but it has a very um, primitive prediction of what, where the pipe will be, what, what the uh, world is like. And at first it just worries about um, the opening and its location. And the bird doesn't know how to fly through it yet, but very quickly it learns how to fly through it. And then the predictor will give it another pipe, which is right next to it, uh, no, the first one. Uh, and it slows down the world as well. So now it's much easier to learn to fly through two pipes because the world is slow uh, and the pipe is close uh, and the opening is close. Once that works, it starts to give more pipes, but they're all in the same level. The openings are all at the same place. So it's easy to learn to fly through that. And once uh, the prescriptor learns to fly through that, it starts moving those pipes like here, uh, and you actually have to make more sophisticated control actions. Um, and that's what happens when you're doing the automated curricular learning. Um, I know that this video may be a little choppy uh, through Zoom, um, but if you go to this URL, you, you can see it in, in, in real time and it, it's, it's more illuminated. But I think that you did get the idea of what's happening in here. Um, okay. Uh, so now let's move to um, the real world application uh, that we've developed uh, with ESP um, and that's very topical one. Um, so early this year, um, after, after working on Flappy Bird for a while, um, the world went to a lockdown and uh, we, we realized that this, is, uh, this situation is actually something that we can um, formulate in terms of ESP uh, and have ESP learn to make decisions of how we should manage the lockdown. Um, so that was really the, the motivation for it. Um, and it's important to point out that this is not the same kind of a model that existed at the time and still people are used to looking at. Almost all the modeling work that has gone in the COVID-19 is about prediction. It's about looking at the curve of say cases in this case, number of uh, COVID-19 um, infections uh, and then predicting how many of those cases will there be in the future. So here's a timeline starting from March, going all the way to the end of the year. Uh, this is um, a um, time course of the number of cases. I think this might've been Iran. Uh, and, and then at this point, we are in the current date and our predictor then uh, makes a guess of how many cases there will be in the future. And also it might give you a confidence interval like, uh, plus minus 25th percentile where, where the number of cases will be. Um, so we all look used to looking at these kind of models already in March, uh, they were coming out. Um, and also some of the models also took into, uh, into account what non-pharmaceutical interventions were being uh, instantiated. And they mean things like closing schools, uh, restricting public transportation, requiring people to wear masks, uh, canceling public events, limiting gatherings to 10 people or less, and so on. Those are non-pharmaceutical interventions, not vaccinations or treatments or anything like that, 
but just trying to modify people's behavior so that we could keep uh, this growth of the, of, of the progression of the disease in, um, under control. Um, and that's what our model does. It's not just a predictive model, although the predictive model is still there. We need it in order to evaluate these policies, uh, these intervention policies, mitigation containment policies, um, because that's what the neural network learns to do. It looks at this time series and tells us close the schools, uh, keep workplaces open halfway, close public events. Uh, that's what the prescription model here tells us. And then we use the predictive model to evaluate how good that policy is. Where do the cases go? So that's an important distinction. We are not just predicting what will happen, but also what we should do about it. And that's the first and a still pretty much the unique uh, approach uh, using machine learning with COVID-19. Now, first we do need to build a predictor. And it turned out that there's actually a group at Oxford um, who's been working on it since the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, they have about a hundred people uh, um, who are monitoring um, publications, press releases, uh, policies, cases around the world um, for different countries. And they built this database of uh, cases, deaths, and also the interventions that, were, that the government had established in different countries. And also in some cases, smaller units like um, Scotland, Wales, um, England, and, and UK, and, and the different states in the US. Uh, and they're also working on India and Brazil and different provinces there. Um, but it's at the pretty high level, what's done in a country in order to keep uh, the cases from exploding. And because the different countries entered the pandemic at different times, there was some data already to predict what's happening in another country um, and therefore establish better policies. So this was a situation where such modeling made sense, uh, but we are completely relying on, on Oxford data uh, and they're doing a good job. They're committed to continuing uh, through the end of the year and into the next year uh, and collecting this data. And they've been expanding the scope of the data they collect. They started publishing mask ordinances, for instance, just a couple of weeks ago, and they had to go all the way to the beginning of time, or at least in uh, beginning of year, um, to, to encode what mask uh, restrictions and ordinances had been done up to today. Um, but that's now part of the database, and that can be evaluated. Now, when the model says wear masks, we can evaluate what its effect might be because we have the data. Now, um, so that's a starting point. We have the data and that's very unusual. Never in the history of pandemics before has it been possible to have such data and almost in real time. I mean, we had pandemics before. There was, um, of course, the uh, 1918 influenza pandemic, uh, but some of us uh, might remember, or our parents, um, in, uh, in a, a epidemic in the, uh, 50s, I guess, and 60s, and it was pretty bad in Finland too. It was called, I think, the Chinese influenza epidemic. Uh, and it also killed a lot of people, a lot of people got sick. Uh, and, uh, and then there were small scale SARS um, and um, swine flu and others. Of course, Ebola, very small scale, fortunately. But now this is a global pandemic uh, and we also get data right away when, it, when it's happening. There's only a couple of weeks of delay, but we get it very quickly. Now the standard compartmental models have been there since the early 1900s um, by the uh, influenza ep epidemic. They are based on differential equations uh, and dividing the population into compartment compartments like susceptible, uh, infected, recovered, maybe uh, exposed. Uh, you can add more compartments and you can add network uh, structure around about it. Uh, maybe even agent-based simulation, but the foundation is differential equation that describe how uh, transmission happens. And it requires setting a lot of parameters uh, that are not known and they have to be estimated uh, and it is difficult to get them right. Um, while this works pretty well in predicting um, how the epidemic will spread, but if you have interventions, it becomes difficult. You know, it's very hard to say how each intervention actually affects the, the parameters, the constants of transmission and have compartmental models track how those interventions work. So therefore we need a different approach. We tried actually initially compartmental models, uh, but then we found this data set and realized that we could just train a neural network or random forest or something to model this data. 
with cases and as well as the MPIs, the non-pharmaceutical interventions, and build a phenomenological model. A model that does not understand what's going on underneath, like the compartmental model does, but it's just modeling the shape of that, uh, of that plot. That's what a phenomenological model is. It's a surface level model. But it turned out to our surprise perhaps, but certainly uh, we got lucky in the sense that the data was enough. The, inter the uh, effects of interventions, the non-linearities, the hidden variables that are very hard to get into compartmental models, they are all expressed in the data um, time series. And it was possible to learn those phenomenologically and make good predictions. Um, now we still needed to do some work in coming up with a predictor that would work. Um, obviously you could just train a maybe LSTM neural network, um, a, a time series pr uh, processing neural network to do the prediction. But it turned out that it was better to separate the two time series, the number of cases and the uh, interventions in a different stream of time series, because now it's possible to put in constraints. Uh, for instance, that if you increase your stringency of MPIs, uh, the predictions should never increase. They should go down. There should be a monotonic effect of harder restrictions. Uh, and also population constraints, like you can have more cases than the number of people in the country, for instance. So that would be a constraint on the top line. Um, and it was possible to put such constraints into the network design, and we got pretty good predictive models this way. And then, um, yeah, and these models, uh, you look at 21 days in the past, and then you can roll them out uh, into the future. And that means that when you make a prediction, it becomes an input, and then you predict the next day, and that becomes a, uh, an input, and then you predict the next day, and this way you can roll out prediction indefinitely long, having this kind of a time window of 21 days. Uh, and then we developed a way of applying Rio, uh, the Gaussian process-based uncertainty model, uh, in order to estimate how confident we are on those predictions. Uh, and it did actually work quite well. Um, we did some studies where we uh, went back in time and run uh, the predictor rolled it out into the present day. And we look at those curves and they match very well. Here's Italy, here's Germany at one point in time. Um, we've done many others, of course, to evaluate um, how accurate it is. And it turns out that it works quite well. Uh, not everywhere, uh, not all the time, uh, but by and large, it's relatively accurate. And this is interesting because we knew that the data was not perfect by, by any means. There are countries that report in a very strange manner. Uh, some countries don't do anything in the weekends. Others are trying to fudge the numbers to make it look good for the uh, big boss of the country. Uh, there are all kinds of reasons why the case data is uh, unreliable. Testing was really an earlier, in, in particular, very unreliable. Um, and we consider it predicting deaths, uh, but that's first of all kind of morbid. <laughs> it's more fun to predict cases perhaps uh, or less depressing, but also because there are just so many more cases that it actually turned out to be more reliable in the end than, than deaths. And also deaths are not uh, accurate either. We know roughly because we can compare what deaths we do expect and how many deaths there really are, but there are also secondary effects. People don't go to doctor anymore. So, <clears throat> so that they are not accurate numbers either. Um, but that's why we're predicting um, cases. Um, and indeed it was accurate and the real the uncertainty was also uh, reasonable. So the prescriptor then, uh, given all that work on a predictor, the prescriptor was relatively straightforward. It was a um, neuroevolution approach, evolving a neural net that takes the same input um, uh, as its context and then generates suggestions for the different dimensions of NPIs as its output. And here you can see uh, the listing of, of those that are um, actual restrictions on people. Um, we also have added since then testing, contact tracing, public information campaigns, and mask ordinances. Uh, but these are the most important ones to begin with, schools, workplaces, public events, gatherings, public transportation, actual lockdown, stay at home, uh, internal movement in general, and international travel. Um, so this is the neural network that looks at, again, the 21 days of history uh, of cases and MPIs, and then recommends what to do today. And we can then roll this out into the future. Um, and these are evaluated based on how accurate, um, or sorry, how 
low the case numbers are after imposing these uh, recommendations, as well as what's the total cost of them. Uh, you want to keep things as open as possible. So a cost is associated, associated with each one of these uh, recommendations and we want to minimize the total cost. Now, it's a little difficult to say how much is workplace co closing compared to cost uh, compared to stay at home or international travel. So in the demo that I'll show you, they all just equal weight. Um, but um, we also now have an extension where you can set the weight and, and also where you have to optimize for any weighting uh, that's given to you. Uh, but right now, let's just assume that each one has equal weight and the total cost is minimized. Uh, and this is what you will get if you run evolution. You get trade-offs. Um, and there are solutions, prescriptors, that minimize cases, keep the, co the human cost, the health cost down. And then there are prescriptors that minimize uh, the economic cost or the MPI cost, even though the cases go up. And then there are trade-offs between them. So what you saw here is the prescriptors that were discovered over evolution. Uh, and at this point, I wanna switch to a live demo. Uh, this is an interactive demo on the web. If you go to evolution.ml, you'll find it underneath there. Um, and this allows you to explore the predictors and prescriptors. So you can go to a country, uh, whatever you like, <laughs> Uh, almost all the countries are here, and as, as I said, states as well in some countries, um, except those that haven't had enough deaths, like there must be at least 10 deaths. There are only a few countries anymore like that. Uh, this one is actually, we've selected Italy, uh, and we can then look at uh, what's happening in Italy. Now, this is now on a pipeline. Uh, most of my slides were prepared somewhere here in the summer, uh, but now we are uh, in mid-November. And this is um, in a pipeline that whenever Oxford updates their data, we, uh, we draw it in and we build predictors and prescriptors every day or every other day whenever the data comes out. Uh, so this is always different when I come back. Um, and here it shows, of course, the alarming past history. There was a catastrophe in March, but it was nothing compared to what's happening now. Uh, this is much, much worse, several times worse. Now, we've learned quite a bit and we learn how to restrict people's behavior. So the current MPIs are actually being somewhat effective. This blue dotted line indicates what the prediction is if those predict uh, prescriptors are kept in effect. This orange line is a predict on what will happen if we select the recommendations of the most stringent predictor, uh, prescriptor, sorry. And here we are visualizing the behaviors of those prescriptors. So this is predictor, this is prescriptor. This is past history of MPIs, color coding, the different dimensions. So the darker, the more string, the darker the plot, the more stringent it is. So schools were completely closed in Italy since March, they opened up in September and they are now part way closed, halfway closed. Uh, public events are still closed um, and, um, Internal movement is restricted. Uh, facial coverings are now, let's see, uh, public sp uh, in, required in all shared and public spaces outside the home and so on. Um, so this color coding indicates the stringency and it's not a complete lockdown. This would be a complete lockdown. So this is the recommendation of that one prescriptor, closed everything. And then what the prediction is, the cases will go down faster. But as you see, we've learned some things. It's not necessarily to do a complete lockdown. With a less than a complete lockdown, we already have a pretty good handle on how to minimize cases. And now here, we can select different prescriptors from that Pareto front that I showed you. Now, if we go all the way to the right, we open up the economy completely, no restrictions, do whatever you want. Not so good, <laughs> it will get a lot worse. It will get to 150,000 cases a day is the prediction by January um, with certainly a lot of uncertainty. But um, if, if everything is opened up, which would look like this, if everything is opened up, no restrictions on anything, COVID-19 will run rampant. Uh, but it turns out that you don't have to go that far. You can limit um, 
some of the activities that people perform and do quite well. Oops, uh, this is now uh, a little less, uh, quite a bit less restrictive than what currently is done. Yet the prediction is that it performs a little bit better. Um, and that's interesting. This is something that people don't know. We can use AI to make these recommendations um, that people might miss. Um, and here is actually the current lesson. It's, it's so interesting. When we started um, in, in May or so, we saw that schools and uh, workplaces were always the strongest, the most important ones. But schools no longer come up the same way as they used to. Workplaces always do. This is something that the system has learned. Work is where it happens. We are indoors. We are with the same people eight hours a day. We have very close proximity. We talk a lot. <laughs> uh, we give presentations in a closed room that's packed. That's where the transmission happens. We understand that now. We didn't understand it back here. Um, and that's what it's saying that, that be very careful what you do in workplaces because that's where most of the transmission happens. Inter interesting enough, also stay at home is very strong, but it's the combination of the two that really makes this, this work. Everything else is opened up. But notice, remember, all of these have the same cost. Now, if you really, really need to have people move and have workplaces open, we would have an objective function where there are co coefficients that emphasize these two. And then uh, the prescriptors that evolve will learn to utilize other restrictions. Okay, well, you can play with this yourself and we're have only limited time. I just wanna show Finland. Uh, the uncertainty metrics are very difficult to compute. It takes the time. So we only do it for a number of countries where the cases are the worst. So Finland is unfortunately not one of them. So we don't have uncertainty, but we have something quite interesting here already. Um, if the current restrictions are held and not strengthened, it's not gonna be nice. Uh, the, the model predicts that in Finland, we might get thousands of cases per day um, with the current restrictions. Um, there is a way to be you know, conservative and, and close things down at workplaces and stay at home again. This is the same, same prescriptor. There might be even other places here. I need to turn off the current um, MPIs because otherwise we don't see uh, the detail. Uh, one sec. Um, but uh, we, can, we can be a little bit more lenient, uh, and now I lost the connection, and, and find that there are ways of keeping the uh, number of uh, transmissions down while, okay, let me try to re reload it, okay. Um, while um, still opening some aspects of the economy. Hopefully this comes up. And we can go back to Finland here. Okay, um, one sec, I'll get there. And we'll see, um, so full lockdown would certainly work. Uh, we see that there was a first wave and now we're in the middle of the second wave, which is worse than the first. The numbers are very low. I mean, we talk about 150, 200 cases compared to the rest of the world. This is really, Finland is doing ex very well, extremely well, but uh, we can get rid of the pandemic if we lock things down. We don't have to go that far according to the model. Uh, we can open things up quite a bit uh, and still keep the number of cases uh, from growing. This is kind of the boundary. If we don't do much, if we just focus on workplaces and everything else opens up, we would still have uh, a, a problem. Uh, but if we do a little bit more, we can improve. I think the next one is already bringing things down uh, like that. Uh, and that was just making a stay at home requirement work. Uh, and then uh, maybe even more strict, you know, we add something else, uh, this comes, starts to come down right away. Um, so there you go. Um, and uh, it's interesting how the current prescriptors tend to focus on these two. Uh, like I said, we can change the rating, the decision maker can do that and explore the alternative uh, choices, but that's what the tool allows you to do. It allows you to figure out what your preference is, how much you value economy versus uh, an open movement versus uh, bringing the cases down. And you can also, uh, in principle, fix some of these restrictions. Like you say, economy has to stay open no matter what. Workplaces have to stay open. What can we give me 
under those condi conditions. And we can evolve prescriptors that satisfy that. Okay, uh, there's a lot more to do in the demo, but we are running out of time. So let me just uh, go ahead and wrap up. Um, um, I did wanna point out a couple of things we've learned from the demo. Uh, yeah, schools and workplaces we talked about. Uh, there are also cases where uh, the prescriptors are quite creative. For instance, here, it learned that opening and closing in alternate weeks uh, might actually help. Uh, and this is because there are no dimensions for uh, the prescriptor to tell you that you have to use plexiglass dividers or you have to keep windows open. It, it, those are not in its vocabulary, but it could discover something creative. And that is that keep the workplace open, then close it for a while, keep it open, close it for a while. And this is something that people are now doing. And this was discovered by the model back in, in May or so. Um, so that was interesting. Um, now, also, it's interesting to go back in time and uh, ask what would have happened? What were our options? And for instance, in UK, um, UK eventually went into a complete lockdown and they got their pandemic under control back in April. Um, if they hadn't, it would have been a lot worse. But also we find with the model that all they needed to do at that time was to uh, close schools. And most likely the pandemic would not have exploded and they would, have need, would not have needed a full lockdown. So we can go back and ask these questions. We have to make sure that we use data that's relevant to that time point, uh, but these are possible questions to ask and we can learn from them for the future pandemic, whatever that might be. Um, we also find um, some limitations in that the data for Italy, for instance, when we make recommendations for Italy in March and April, it was based on China and South Korea uh, and other countries that experienced the pandemic first. And it turned out that it wasn't quite applicable to Italy. Italy has a different culture, different demographics, uh, and they should have done better with the restrictions they had according to the model. But that suggests to you that there are variables of culture, demographics, and other factors that the model should take into account in order to be more accurate. Now, in the long term, though, I think that there's a great potential here, not just for this pandemic, not necessarily just for the future pandemics, but optimizing uh, responses to disasters in general. They might be forest fires, they might be earthquakes, they might be global warming. Um, and more generally, there's an opportunity to build a society uh, that's unbiased. And by that, what I mean is that the decision makers, the, the um, people um, decide what kind of society they want, how much they value uh, productivity, um, progress, um, growth, uh, or equality, uh, maintaining the environment, um, other variables. And then those become objective functions or weights on the objective functions. And then we use AI to design the policies on how to keep economy going with these constraints and, and uh, that might be social as well as uh, economic. Uh, and maybe someday it will be actually considered irresponsible for people to make such decisions when there's AI that can make them better and be more objective uh, achieving those constraints. Humans have all kinds of biases. They have personal agendas. There's graft. There's all kinds of problems that get in the way of making optimal decisions when it's left for humans. Uh, but when it's left for AI, it only optimizes what it's given and, uh, and it does it in an unbiased uh, way. It can do it in an unbiased way. So for the first time, we can actually make the society the way we want it to be. Now, when I first showed this slide, I got a lot of pushback. Uh, and of course it was just a pie in the sky. But now when you look at the COVID-19 as a use case, as an actual example, it's not so crazy anymore. This is actually something that could be implemented. Uh, and we are at the stage where we are ready to take this to the, the real world. Um, and that's my, my last point. Uh, just on Tuesday, um, we started um, a competition with XPRIZE on doing exactly that. Using this setup that we developed as a platform, uh, there's now an XPRIZE competition on building better predictors and better prescriptors using whatever approach you want. Uh, and there's a 
tiny little incentive there, half a million dollars uh, for two winners uh, who are the best at building predictors and prescriptors. Um, and this is of course all marketing, but uh, the technology is ours. Uh, we both build a platform, give, um, give, uh, give you a starting point. I just showed you the predictor that we had and the prescriptors we had are starting points. You can download them, you can run and improve upon them. Um, the prize is uh, sponsored by Cognizant. Um, that's the CEO of Cognizant who, who uh, eventually made the decision to sponsor it. Uh, and it's a collaboration with XPRIZE, which is an organization that has organized a lot of prizes, including Moonshot, uh, build a private rocket that goes in, and runs into the moon that inspired, for instance, SpaceX, which is right now up there in the space station. Um, and they've, other, they've had other competitions, mapping the ocean floor, feeding the next billion people, all kinds of things that are between academic research and practical applications. Before research becomes commercial, XPRIZE has tried to encourage innovation uh, to make it, to scale it and take it real world. Uh, and this is exactly what we are, uh, we are doing here. Uh, here's the timeline of the competition. Like I said, it was launched just Tuesday. Uh, we've already tried to contact machine learning researchers and other researchers uh, for almost a month uh, to, to let them know that they can start working on it. Uh, there's a predictor phase, uh, which ends in early January, and then a prescriptor phase that ends in late February. And the winners are announced uh, in, in early Feb uh, late February, March. Uh, and the idea is that with, if we do all this, we come up with better ways to predict, better ways to prescribe, um, then they are available for governments and, and uh, organizations to implement. And indeed, we have an advisory board uh, that has some people like that um, in the government. This is the actual XPRIZE site. Uh, you have to go there to sign in. Um, and, um, and then the idea is that the same technology uh, can be used not just to prescribe MPIs, but also to come up with a process of distributing and vaccinating the entire world. Um, because that is also a very challenging decision-making problem with the same kind of variables. Um, you know, manufacturing, storing, trans um, transporting, uh, distributing uh, the vaccines, who gets it first? Uh, how do we, what kind of restrictions we have when the vaccine is being distributed and all that. Um, so that's another next application uh, based on the same ideas, but hopefully the XPRIZE will promote research in it. So we are ready when, when that happens. Okay, so now to wrap up, um, uh, the conclusion, um, the ESP, Evolutionary Surrogate Assisted Prescription, utilizes a surrogate model and evolution to do well in these decision-making tasks, which is a very broad um, applicability uh, area. Um, and we get some interesting things like um, sample efficiency, reliability, low cost and safe, and also the regularization and automated curricular learning that happens in this setup, like we saw in the Flappy Bird. Um, but it's also a general description of general demonstration of the power of data and machine learning. Um, so there's a famous quote that uh, uh, unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics uh, and also unreasonable effectiveness of data. And now we can scale it to unreasonable effectiveness of power and machine learning in dealing with the problems in the real world. So we are on the verge of doing that now and we can take it uh, to the real world um, and, and can do better in managing healthcare, business, education, various societal decision-making, and in particular, uh, in dealing with the pandemic that we right now have to deal with. So that's it. If you're interested, we have a website here that uh, demonstrates, that has all these demos and has uh, papers and, uh, and also uh, videos, uh, as well as the COVID, uh, the uh, XPRIZE website, which allows you to actually dive right in uh, and build, um, build models that can change the world and also get rich by doing that, at least get re recognized. Um, and, uh, and of course, that's a launching point for a lot of good research in the future, we hope. Okay, so thank you. And I'd be happy to take questions. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Risto. Uh, this was really very exciting. Let me, give, uh, let me be a surrogate of an audience to give you a standing ovation. <laughs> Okay, now is the time for, for questions. Uh, you should uh, raise your hand 
in order to ask a question. Hello? Yeah, we hear you. Yeah. Thank you for the interesting talk. So uh, my question is regarding the prediction uh, that you showed during the COVID uh, case. So it's interesting that uh, initially when you go back in time in March, so there was this, uh, uh, the red line says that the schools uh, and uh, the workplaces have strict uh, restrictions, they were closed. Uh, if they had closed, then they, uh, the number of models, uh, the number of cases would have been lower. And it's very interesting that now, if we look at the model, then they're saying that schools are not, uh, do not necessarily need to be that strict in because in some cases, I even saw that the line was yellow in color. So, uh, yeah, so my question is, isn't it uh, like, uh, the schools are equally uh, those kinds of places where teachings are happening and it's a close confined space where uh, a lot of students will go together to work uh, to study. So isn't like um, intuitively, I would say that is also uh, should be a hard restriction. So why could the AI be showing something like that? Like, uh... Yes, thank you. That was very good because I forgot to talk about it. That's absolutely clear. Uh, we are seeing a very different recommendations now than we did back in March and May and so on. Uh, at that time, schools were always uh, more important and as, as important as, as the workplace restrictions. And now we are not seeing that anymore. Systematically, uh, the models that now come out uh, recommend workplaces, but they, uh, they don't recommend as much of school closings. Uh, and we've seen this now, this is like the third such um, innovation. Um, there has been multiple waves. Like if you go to say US, I think this is the United States, you can see that in the United States, we actually had three waves. We are in our third wave now, um, if you look at it like this. Uh, and, and indeed the recommendations were different in April and they were different in the summer. And now they are again different. Uh, so they have different profiles. And this is one of the most striking differences that schools were always recommended to be closed in April. And now, even though schools are starting in Northern Hemisphere, at least uh, and in the winter, they, they allow them to open, the models allow them to open. And I think that the difference is that the world has changed again. The schools are not the same they were back here. Um, I have a kid going to school. Uh, she went there this morning. They go in a line outside with six feet of separation. Each one get, has to have a health check. And then they go in a line to a classroom that has 30% capacity. Everybody is enclosed in a, in a plexiglass container. When they eat lunch, there are three people at a table that used to have 12 people on it. Everybody's wearing masks. Uh, the windows are open. We're in California, they can be open. Um, and, and, they are, and those classrooms that don't have enough windows, they have air purifiers. Um, of course, this requires tremendous resources to do but the schools are nothing, nothing like they were back here. It's, it's like, it's a completely different behavior. And I think that that's happening to some degree around the world, that there was a, a period over the summer when the schools had time to figure out how to reopen safely. And they did it by and large. And now we are seeing that schools are by and large okay, uh, but workplace is still a big problem. We don't know what to do about those. And that's what the model is, what is saying. And this has been to me the most fascinating because we've seen it now three times. We look at the recommendations and go, that's weird. Why is, that, why is it doing that? And a couple of weeks later, we actually read something that makes sense and we understand, oh, it actually picked it up from the data even before people started talking about it. And this is the third time that it's happened. So I think that that's, that's the main conclusion that data can be that powerful. And it can be that conclusions can be drawn that quickly. That's why we also hope that when the vaccines come out, we are right there. We can be quick enough uh, to make recommendations that matter because it will come out at different times in different countries. We can learn from some countries and apply it to others. Um, and, and also the data is very fast. Oxford is ready to collect it. They don't have to go back to May or March to start encoding the data. They can do it right now. And therefore the data should have only a week, a couple of weeks of lag. Uh, and therefore it might be possible to do it. 
Uh, but that was a very good observation. And, and I think it's one of the main lessons that we learned um, about the power of data uh, and these models. Yes, thank you. Thanks. Any further questions? Yeah, how do I unmute? Yeah. This is Raymond. Nice to meet you or see you, Rista, again. Hey, uh, I'd like to ask uh, about uh, the possibility of doing sort of sensitivity analysis with this methodology so that you could do a risk analysis that what the data would be something which would, uh, any changes in the data would cause major changes in the, uh, the prediction. Is there a way of doing that with your model? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's very important. Uh, and in general, that's always the challenge when you're using neural networks and deep learning is the explainability, uh, what it's doing. Um, and, and we do have a, oh, well, you have a kind of a quick answers, but also a really principled one is to um, not use a neural network, but use a, a set of rules. So we can, in principle, uh, we now evolving neural networks in this role uh, of like, like right this one um, and making these recommendations and we have a neural network model that makes these prescriptions. Um, but we could also learn a set of rules um, and it could be learned from the data itself or we could learn a set of rules that imitates what the neural network is doing. And when we have a set of rules, they are legible, they are understandable and you can come up with an explanation, for instance, uh, for some of these paths, uh, some of these uh, shapes that we see, why do we actually have this kind of a pattern? If that was something that's produced by a set of rules, we could look at what features it's, those rules are looking at in order to make those decisions. Um, so I think that that's a mo most powerful, most expressive approach. Um, other than that, uh, right now, without the rule set evolution and explanation, um, there are techniques that systematically do what you suggest, that they systematically modify the inputs uh, and they uh, observe the, the changes in the output in order to find what the system is most sensitive to. And you can also go inside the neural network. If I go back to the neural net I have, um, like here in the hidden layer, you can find units and then uh, map them to their optimal input. You can see that this unit, for instance, is most happy it responds the strongest with a certain pattern of inputs. So you can, you can make a guess of what it represents. It represents, for instance, I don't know, an outbreak in a, in a, in a local area or something, or it can represent um, uh, at risk of international travel. Uh, it, so to some extent that's possible in neural networks. Some of these units can, through the sensitivity analysis, uh, be identified as representing a certain perspective. Um, and then, of course, you have halfway there because you can see what modifications, you can modify the outputs of these and see what, uh, how the decisions will change. And then you know what those units actually look into. So you can tie inputs and outputs together. But it's, it's, it's pretty limited. Uh, the, it, you don't, all, not all the units here can actually be identified that way. They don't take on identifiable subtasks most of the time. Sometimes they do, most of the time they don't. Uh, so there's a limitation of what you can do. And therefore I think that um, an explanation subsystem of some kind uh, or a side system that does just the explanation might be necessary. But all that is, is future work. We are not quite there yet. Um, at the moment, we're just concerned of getting performance up, uh, but understanding has to come uh, because that is important for people to understand why these decisions are made. Great, good luck. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, any further? Further questions, comments? Yeah, hi. Uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, I was wondering, excluding perhaps a lack of data, what would you say is the biggest limitation of the ESP approach? Um, yeah, so I think what really keeps me up at night is, is the um, not so much lack of data, but um, well, maybe it's, it's, it's like, it's not um, uniform, it's biased. Uh, and there might be uh, artifacts in it that are not real. So we might end up making 
recommendations because our data was warped in some way. Uh, now, in a lot of cases, if there are inaccuracies and um, in the data in some country, in another country there isn't. So there's uh, kind of a, they cancel out to a large extent. But I'm worried about things that don't cancel out that are not real. And this, it's very hard to know whether those extra, uh, exist. So, and we don't really have a good way of evaluating that. We, we, that's why we have the scratch pad, for instance. So it's a, another way of putting it. You probably know about adversarial attacks. Uh, that's another, that's, that attacks the same kind of vulnerability. These models are vulnerable in that sense. There are strange inputs or combinations of inputs that can cause them to generate strange outputs. And currently we cannot tell what those inputs might be. And we cannot tell when the outputs are out of whack, when the model is outside of its domain or it's, it's, it's fallen into one of those, those bad states. Um, and now by having a lot of data uh, and in particular having a diversity of data, like we do have 188 countries, I think that's the best guard against it. Uh, if we were just building a model for an individual country, we might fall into that trap more often. But, but since we have so much variability, I think it makes for more robust models. And there's a lot more research that's coming out um, also. The, and I also pointed you to the point of predictors that are in, imperfect in the beginning, uh, and then they change. You also get robustness. So there's some internal factors that make these models more robust but still there's no guarantee. Uh, and that's what I'm most worried about, that the data is not just, that, that there's not, not just that there's not enough of it, but it's not um, representative enough. And there's some of these traps that we can fall into. Um, so that's technically the most challenging um, question. And we're definitely working on that. A lot of other people are working on adversarial robustness and robustness of models in general. Now, obviously the biggest challenge for us now is that we really think that we have a tool and the community has a tool and a machine learning based on data that can change the world and make it better. How the heck can we communicate it uh, to the people who could use this tool to do it? Uh, and this is, a, this is a really big challenge. And that's one of the reasons why we, we went with the XPRIZE that hopefully we can bring it to the awareness uh, of the world at large and they could see the opportunity and become comfortable uh, with things like, um, like uh, like this, uh, AI-enabled society. There's so much to be gained, but the attitudes have to be a little different. They have to be more informed and educated. Um, so I don't know how to do that. This is, you know, I'm a machine learning researcher, but that's something that um, I think is a great opportunity. Thanks. Okay, any, any further, further questions to raise? Well, let, let me ask myself a, a question about, uh, because countries have uh, different cultures and their uh, cultures reflect on, on uh, people's behavior. How one could uh, uh, kind of uh, counter that or take that into account? Yes, uh, that is a, also a very good question. Um, and that's one of the next steps that uh, we would like to do. And also we encourage people who participate in XPRIZE uh, to look into. There are several, XPRIZE is not just um, doing things better, it's um, exploring, exploring um, other sources of data, uh, trying to make the recommendations more general, take into account the preferences of the decision makers. There are real scientific questions that you can address in the framework of XPRIZE. Uh, and, and this is one of those. Can you take into account variables that describe um, the society, the country, the demographics, how many young people, how many old people, how much mobility, what's the weather, uh, obesity rates. Uh, there are all kinds of factors that can come in and affect the predictions and prescriptions um, that we are not currently taking into account, but we could. I mean, to some degree we do, but um, because the data, the time series um, has all of those effects embedded in it, but it might still be helpful to represent those variables directly. Um, and then and I don't, what I'm talking about is variables that describe the society, um, culture, uh, demographics, but there are also variables that 
measure, for instance, how well the MPIs are working, whether people are actually wearing masks, or whether they are maintaining social distance. There's cell phone data, many, many sources now of cell phone data, how close people get, uh, and uh, so on. And, and in principle, that is already reflected implicitly in this time series, but it might still have an effect and we could bring it in. It's a little hard to do in XPRIZE because everybody should have access to that. It's a time series data also, a, a parallel, ser um, parallel stream of data. Um, but that is a good question. When the data comes available, could we use that? Probably we could, um, or maybe not. I mean, maybe it's more complex, maybe it's misleading and maybe the, the time series of the cases and the MPIs is all we need. People respond to MPI, MPIs in a different manner. It doesn't really matter whether they follow it or not because we see whether they follow it or not in this curve of cases. So having an, a variable that tells you how well they follow might be irrelevant. We don't know, but it's still a question we need to ask and we need to try. Okay, thank you. Any further questions? Seems to be silence here. <laughs> uh, okay, I think time time is running, so I think uh, we are more or less uh, reached the time we had to reserve for this. So once again, uh, I would like to thank you, Risto. Very very nice talk you you gave, and uh, I think we learned learned a lot. And uh, let's. Uh, I mean, at least virtually give a big hand uh, to Risto once again and uh, thanking him. And, uh, so My pleasure. Uh, I hope uh, that uh, when this pandemic um, goes a little bit lower, you could come uh, and rerun this kind of uh, talk uh, again, but now physically. <laughs> Would love to do that someday. Okay. Thank you.